I've actually known Mark since 1991. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. He looks doesn't look like he's 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't a baby then. He was actually yeah, a grad yeah, student. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's been a long time. And I'm really pleased that he's here to join us. Mark comes from uh, Georgia State University with Georgia Tech. Tech. Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning. Always an excuse, right? So, uh, comes with us with a rich background, both in computer science as well as educational psychology is actually a joint degree. How many people get joint degrees, right? Joint PhDs in two disciplines that aren't necessarily that easy. Psychology and computer science. So Mark did it. And he's been following that path throughout his career, right? So he has this dual life in which he both does computer science and he studies how people do computer science. So we're gonna hear a little bit more what Mark does. He uh, works both at the higher ed level and at the secondary level in computer science, so it'll be really interesting to hear what you say. And Great. We look forward to a wonderful presentation to and discussion to afterwards. Not, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so here's uh, where I want to start, and I honestly have to, uh, I have to tell you, this, I, I put together this first slide before I met anyone from Lyman Briggs. So for me, the story of what I do starts out with C.P. Snow. Um, my advisor, Elliot Soloway at the University of Michigan, required all of his graduate students to read the two cultures. Um, if, if you're not, I'm get here with Lyman Briggs, most people. How many people are not familiar with the story of the two cultures? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so, C.P. Snow was a science advisor to the British government during World War II, and he decried what he saw as a split in Western civilization between the scientists and the humanities folks. Um, by the way, he blamed the humanities folks. Um, he felt that the that humanities didn't recognize that science was not just yet another way of coming to know the world. It was one that was particularly privileged because it was based on evidence in the scientific method. Um, the reason why Eliot had all of us read this book was to consider the possibility of who needs what it is that we're teaching but isn't in the room. How do you provide computer science education to the people who don't classify themselves as being scientists? And that's the starting point for the kind of work that, that I do. So uh, sort of four pieces to my talk today. Um, they're not all equally long, so don't panic. I, I won't keep you too long, I promise. Um, the first is that for those who are of the computer science background, the goal of achieving a comp computationally literate society, literally to teach everybody about programming and about computing, was actually given to us by the very earliest computer scientists, literally the people who coined the term computer science. Um, the second part is some of the challenges to achieve a computationally literate society. What are the problems that are keeping us from teaching computing to absolutely everybody? The third is a couple of projects that I've been working on to think about how do we create new kinds of computing education. And the fourth is to think more broadly, uh, I was explicitly asked, so if you came here, Mark, what kinds of things would you want to work on? And think about what is the role of supporting computational literacy um, for STEM learning. So the story for me starts in 1961. Uh, the MIT Sloan School had a symposium called Computers in the World of the Future. The people at this event, when you read the, the who's there, is the who's who of computer science in 1961. Grace Hopper was there, John McCarthy, Alan Newell, C.P. Snow was there. C.P. Snow gave a really amazing talk, which I'm not going to spend too much time on today, um, where he talked about amazingly prescient. He said, algorithms are going to control our lives, and those who don't understand algorithms won't know what questions to ask about the algorithms. And the decisions about algorithms are going to be made in secret by people that you won't even know who they are. I mean, that he said that in 1961 is amazingly prescient about today. The one talk that, oh, in this book, uh, by, edited by Martin Greenberger, came out in 1962. It is the transcripts of all of the lectures and all the discussants, which is just amazing. I, I look at this is a scan of my copy. It's way, way, way out of print. The particular lecture that I want to talk about is the one by Alan Perlis. Alan Perlis, uh, for the computer scientists who are well familiar, for everyone else, he's the first winner of the ACM Turing Award, which is the closest the computer science has to a Nobel Prize. Um, he started the computer science departments at Yale and at Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon University. And in his talk, he explicitly argued that everyone on campus ought to learn computer science, and explicitly that programming should be considered part of a liberal education. And he made this argument by contrasting computer science with calculus. Calculus is the study of rates. In general, we consider calculus to be something that, if you're well-educated, you have some calculus. 
Okay, calculus is the study of rates. He says, rates are really important to lots and lots of people. He says, computer science is the study of process, and everyone cares about process. As we'll talk about in a few minutes, I teach the business students at, at Georgia Tech. I teach their intro computer science. And when I tell them, yeah, in computer science, we know how to compare processes and even prove whether or not a process will work or not. And those who do logistics, their jaws drop. They've never thought about how do you prove a process works or not? And how do you compare two processes in terms of their effectiveness or other sorts of uh, resource allocation or constraints? Then he went further and Perlis said, the automated execution of process changes everything. And he talked about how at Carnegie Tech they had started doing business simulations. They were essentially simulating national economies. Before then, economics was not in experimental science. Hey, let's devalue the dollar tomorrow just to see what happens, right? In general, we hope that is not how economists work. But when, <laughs> no, no comments. Um, <laughs> but once you have a simulation of a national economy, you can do those sorts of experiments. It becomes an experimental science. Now, his discussants, one was Peter Elias, who was the head of electrical engineering at the time. Another one of his discussants was J.C.R. Licklider. Okay, I'm curious, how many people in the room know who J.C.R. Licklider is? Okay, whether you think that Al Gore or Vint Cerf is the father of the internet, J.C.R. Licklider is the grandfather of the internet. It was his idea, and he funded the original nodes for, for developing what, back then the DARPAnet. Okay, so he, and, he was the one who funded the guys who invented DCP IP, Vint Cerf, um, Al Gore had something to do with the funding, but that, it was J.C.R. Licklider's idea. So Peter Elias said, okay, really, programming, is it really gonna be that big of a deal? Eventually, isn't the, aren't the computers going to simply understand us? Okay, he didn't know anything about Alexa or Siri, but you know he's, he's wondering, are the computers going to understand that programming as a problem is going to go away? And J.C.R. Licklider had this great response. He says, you know, I'll bet you that language was really annoying to primitive human beings, and yet today we have poetry. Now, Perlis's response was, was slightly different than that. He's saying it's never going to get to the point that the computer will completely understand you. There will always be friction. And overcoming that friction, for the, it's a human job to translate your problem into the primitives that the computer understands. Okay, so in the end, no. If you want to gain the power of the computer, the carrot of, of, the, of the flexibility of the computer, you will have to learn programming. My colleague Betsy Davis, who's a uh, science educator at the University of Michigan, posted this quote on her Facebook wall recently, and I just totally loved it. You'll excuse me, I'm going to read to you for a moment. Developing students' capacity to interpret information and then to make, critique, and revise claims based on evidence must be a primary goal of education. For her, this is, this is such an argument for science education. For me, this is such an argument for computing in science education. The first part is obvious where the computing part comes in, uh, about developing capacity to interpret information. And I'll bet you that Brian can tell us long stories about what it takes to get students to interpret information using a computer. But I actually think that the computer plays a unique and interesting role in the part where we're talking about making, critiquing, and revising claims based on evidence. Because I think that we can see now that a computer encourages us to, us to think about things in, ter in terms of computational processes, in terms of processes in the world, in terms of evidence. So when I think about my intellectual heritage, I see myself as coming from the line of Papert developing Logo, Andy DeSassa developing Boxer. Uh, you won't find the words computational thinking in my talk. I don't tend to like the definitions of computational thinking, but I love Andy DeSassa's definition of computational literacy that it's about using computing as a way of expressing yourself, the same as you will with textual literacy, the way you will numeracy, it's a way of expressing ideas, testing those ideas, sharing those ideas. And in particular, um, Boxer was the programming language he invented in order to be able to explore computational literacy. And I wanted to talk about one of his students' dissertation work, Bruce Sharon, as an example of, of what this evidence thing might, might look like. So, People in this room, I'm guessing everybody in this room, is familiar with this equation. Um, you, you would use it, for example, to describe the motion of a falling object. The current x position is the uh, initial x position plus velocity times t plus one half the a constant acceleration times the, the time element squared. What Bruce did in his dissertation was to explore what do students learn when you teach them with this versus when you teach them with this. This is a boxer simulation which does the same thing. Um, we're setting up the initial position, velocity, acceleration, and then 10 times we process the tick box. 
change the velocity to velocity plus the acceleration, change the position to the position plus the velocity, move forward the velocity, make a dot, repeat the process. We're going to do this 10 times, or yeah, 10 times is, is in this loop. Okay? And so what Bruce explored is, so what's the difference between these? There are advantages to the equations. Equations balance. And so if you're given any certain number of those variables, you can compute the other number of variables, as long as there's only one unknown. And it works in any direction. But what it doesn't give you is causality and a temporal component. Right? So in my dissertation work um, that I did at the University of Michigan, I was having students also build physics simulations. I was having them do it in HyperCard, and then I was exploring issues of scaffolding. But I did ask the students about the physics. And one of, the, one of my favorite quotes from that interview is I'm doing a clinical clinical interview uh, structure that, that Joe was the one who got me started on. Um, and I'm asking people, what happens when you drop a rock off the, 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 the building that we're currently in? How long will it take to get to the ground? I'm going to let you read this for a second. This is a ninth grader um, in, who has not yet had high school physics, who was taking, who was taking my, uh, my summer workshop. We were exploring EMIL, this environment for helping students build physics simulations as a way of learning both physics and computer science. What I think is remarkable about this quote is he is not solving the equation. He is running the simulation in his head. You can see him. This is at one second. This is at two seconds. Oh, no, it's be back. This is, I mean, you see him estimating. He's running that loop that we saw in Bruce Sharon's code. There's similar code in the code that my students are writing. This is a causal process. He sees how acceleration is influencing velocity. This is a temporal process. These are things that you don't get just out of equations. Code offers something more. Computer science offers a new way of thinking about things like evidence and the way that we make claims and arguments. Okay, so if computing education is a good thing, and I hope that I've at least given you some suggestion that it might be a good thing, why aren't we there? What are our challenges? So there's two main challenges that I want to talk about. The first is access and diversity, the issue that we're not reaching everyone. And the second is about the unanswered questions that are keeping us from getting there. Okay, computing in the, in, in the United States, by, uh, by the numbers, I'm going to guess that some of the folks in the room know this, but for other of these, these may be a bit shocking. There are about 25,000 high schools in the United States. There are, as of 2016, 3,206 AP computer science teachers in the United States. So one out of 12, maybe? One out of 10, something like that? Not that many? Okay. To contrast, to get a sense of where we are as computer science teachers, the American Association of Physics Teachers, founded in 1930. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, founded in 1920. The Computer Science Teachers Association was founded in 2005. We are very new to the game. The International Computing Education Research Conference actually started the same year, 2005. We've only been running for 11 years. Uh, and, and by the way, I'll just throw it in again. Amon's team won the best paper award at ICER this last year. <laughs> Why isn't this going? OK, I saw Brian come in. Yay, OK. Brian did this graph for me, which I totally love. And it takes me a minute to explain it, but I think you'll see that it's very powerful. This is all of the advanced placement exams listed along, along the top, top to bottom. Um, the dot indicates the number of test takers. So you know, here we have US history, really big kahuna, English language composition, really, really giant gigantic. And then the really interesting part is the way that this is laid out. This is even female males. Okay, so you can see that most AP exams are actually female dominant. All right? There's computer science. Now let me really freak you out. This is a log scale. <laughs> OK? So yes, physics is male dominant. Here's the two physics dots. But, and physics is way off anybody else. Computer science is even further out. Now this is 2012 data. Um, it's different today, but it isn't that much different. All right, we, we move by about one percentage point per year in terms of female participation. Um, so we're not reaching very many folks. I'm part of an effort called ESEP, the Expanding Computing Education Pathways Alliance. We work with states to improve their computing education policies and the way that they think about computing education. Um, it was part of an effort at, in Massachusetts. There was the Commonwealth Alliance for IT Education, Renee Fall and Rick Adrian. Um, Barbara Erickson and I ran Georgia Computes. And after each of us ran from 2006 to 2012, we merged forces to try to think about how do we help all states. And 
we originally thought, okay, well, Georgia, Massachusetts have been so successful, we'll simply teach that to all the other states. And I had no idea how radically different every single state is in the way that they think about K through 12 education. I've learned a lot, and what I've also learned is how much we don't know. Because when these policymakers ask me questions about ed computing education, I don't have answers for them. And let me share with you some of those. Okay, South Carolina was one of the first states in the United States to make, in the United States to make CS a requirement for graduation. They did this back in the 1980s during the original logo requirement, during all of the logo boom. Um, they never put in funding to train teachers in high school computer science. So they increasingly had to, inc incre uh, they had to increasingly add to the list of classes that met the computer science requirement. Today, there are 90 classes that meet the requirement, only six of which have any programming in them. Um, the rest of them are Photoshop, CAD, uh, keyboarding skills. So when I push on the Department of Ed, I go visit the Department of Ed South Carolina and say, hey, how about if we increase the computer science requirement? They say, okay, we have a really high percentage of special education students in our, in our, in our schools. We have a lot of ESL students in our classes. It says, can you teach computer science to them? And let me tell you, graduating from high school for a special education student is a really important economic factor. They get different kinds of jobs if they can graduate from high school. He says, is computer science and programming specifically so important that they should not be allowed to get those jobs if they don't earn it? And I don't know. We don't have information about different populations taking computer science. I, I sometimes say that in computer science we have this inverse Lake Wobegon effect. We only see the most privileged. We only see the best students in computer science classes. And yet we pretend as if we know what computer science education is for everybody. And we never see the other set of the population. Uh, in Utah, they have a really poor performance rate on AP computer science. As of 2016, they had only 16 females take AP computer science. I suspect there are far more than 16 female high school students in Utah, <laughs> right? But they have decided that they are going to focus on K through eight right now. Why? Because right now, Utah is revising their K through eight science standards, and if they don't do it now, it doesn't happen for a dozen years, okay? I get it, that makes, that makes perfect sense, but then they ask really important questions. How much of computer science can we teach to kids who are five to 10 years old? Um, and if you teach them things at the early grades and you don't have anything in middle school, do they remember it when they get to high school? How about when they get to university? Will it still influence their perceptions of computer science eight years later? Um, what is the cost difference? Scaling computer science in elementary schools is harder than scaling computer science in high schools because there's a lot more of them. Can, how does it work out in terms of the cost-benefit ratio? And finally, Utah has one of the best computer science teacher certifications in the country. They have a, a three levels. Uh, the earliest level can be met with just summer professional development. The middle level requires a couple of computer science classes. The next level requires a couple more. And just about everybody who makes level two then leaves teaching and goes into industry and gets a really high, higher paying job developing software. Okay? How do we prevent that kind of situation where we spend a lot of time on CS Teacher PD simply to fund the software development industry? Georgia computes. This is uh, the number of AP CS exam takers in Georgia starting in 1997. Georgia Computes ran from 2006 to 2012. This stops at 2011. Um, you can see an effect. All right, so here's 2006. 2007 is when we have started having a rise in terms of overall test takers. We had significant impact on the number of women taking AP Computer Science. We had significant impact on the number of Hispanics taking AP Computer Science. The red line represents African Americans, blacks under the APCS, the way the College Board ranks them. Um, it's flat. I mean, there's a slight uptick, but it is not newer, newer the significant difference that we can see in the other two. Why? Why would the same intervention work well for Hispanic and female students, but not work so well for black students? Now, obviously, there's got to be cultural differences, but how do you identify those? How do you develop statewide interventions that really take into account the different cultural values of the different populations that you're trying to attract? These are the sorts of questions that I have answers for. Now, I figured that since I'm coming here, I should give you some Michigan data. Um, and in particular, we've been tracking Michigan data because it's actually a really close fit for Georgia. Um, in the 2010 uh, census, both Georgia and uh, Michigan were 9.8 million. Uh, Georgia has grown a bit more uh, over the last few years, 10.2 million. Michigan's now currently 9.9 million. Um, we have a bit more diversity than in Michigan, but it's, it's comparable. It's, uh, you know, given the 50 states, Michigan and Georgia are pretty darn close. <coughs> 
This is the uh, number of exam takers. Here is Georgia's overall. Here is Michigan's overall. Um, so you can see, so uh, we ran from 2006 to 2012. There has been a lingering effect of that original NSF investment in Georgia computes. Okay, Michigan is also rising, but not nearly at uh, the same rate. Um, I'm gonna blow in the, four, the bottom four numbers, okay? So this is Georgia females. This is Georgia blacks. This is Michigan females. This is Michigan blacks. You had 19 black students take AP computer science in all of Michigan, 9.9 .9 million people last year. Yeah? Just a quick question. Do students have to self-identify their um, ethnicity on yes. these exams? Yes. So could it possibly be that we had more students who were black that took it but didn't identify themselves as black? Certainly, but why would that be different than Georgia? No, that's right. Okay, I just wanted to check that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let me tell you about a couple of projects that I've been working on to try to think about how do we generate new kinds of computing education that meet the needs of students who don't have access, that CP Snow story from the beginning. The first is about teaching computing in context. By teaching computing in a context that makes sense to students, we can make students more successful. Um, the second story is about teaching computing to meet particular needs, and it's about our work with working with high school teachers to teach them about computer science. Okay, in 1999, Georgia Tech decided that computer science was part of the general education requirement. Everybody has to take a course in computer science. From 1999 to 2003, only one course met that requirement. Now, overall, that course had a 78% pass rate, which isn't bad. In some semesters, the uh, female fail rate was twice that of the male uh, fail rate. But when I give you that 78% number, that's for everybody on campus, and we are mostly engineering and science. When we look at individual majors, the story isn't quite so pretty anymore. So in general, students in the liberal arts, architecture, now design, and business schools we're failing in class at around 50% per semester. Why? So what we decided was that for these students, computing is less a tool of calculation as it is a tool of communication. For students in business and liberal arts and design and, archi and, and, design and architecture, they care about digital media. So I'm going to teach them the computing that's behind digital media. We're teaching the same kind of intro computer science. But instead of simply walking over an array to compute an average, we're computing the grayscale or the negative of something. We talk about algorithms um, in, in a general sense. It turns out that the algorithm by which you have one sound fade out while another sound fades in is exactly the same by which you have transparency between two pictures that overlap. Same, same kind of algorithm. Um, when we talk about reversing an array, which everybody does in intro computer science. Reversing an array of numbers is a pretty boring thing. When you reverse a sound, and now it goes It's interesting, right? You catch attention. There's, there's a multimodality effect. Um, let me give you a sense of that for people who don't do computer science in the room, what, what the course looks like. So we take Santa Claus here. Uh, this is my normal uh, demo, but it like totally works for this time of year. Um, <laughs> we define a function, clear red of the picture for pixel, and get pixels of the picture, set the red of the pixel to zero. That gives us the green-blue Santa in the upper right. Um, to create a grayscale Santa, we need a value of luminance of each pixel. Turns out if you simply compute the average of the amount of redness, blueness, and greenness, it works as a pretty good luminance value. And so we get a grayscale Santa. To invert the, the, the colors to get the, the, neg the negative, um, each of these values, red, green, and blue, vary between 0 and 255. So 255 minus the red, minus the green, minus the blue, gives us the dark elf goth Santa look. <laughs> okay. Something that I think is really interesting to point out to people of a computer science persuasion in the room. I explicitly am using Python, and explicitly because the for loop allows me to say, for pixel and get pixels of the picture. This is how we start. These students do not understand the for loop as iteration for several weeks yet. They never face, or they do eventually, but they don't in the first half of the class face the fact that you can have an index number that points to a pixel. Their understanding of computer science is different than, an intro, than a normal intro course because they're coming at it different. They're using the same constructs, but they're using with a different lens, a different perspective, and so they have a different value in the way that they use them. This is those original 
percentages, and these are the new percentages. Um, I did a, uh, an article um, in, in ICER in 2012, International Computing Education Research Conference, um, doing a 10-year retrospective. Overall, the course rate has been 85% or better success rates over the decade without me teaching it. There's no Guzdial effect, as my students have sometimes asked. Um, the, the, the course works for the students. What I see us doing, uh, we'll touch a little bit of ed psych stuff, from Jacqueline Eccles' model of academic related choices. Why do students not choose to go into computer science? Why do they avoid computer science? Or why do they choose to, not to go into computer science? There's this whole big factor, set of factors along the top. There's the, what is the gender role of stereotypes? Do, do women do this? Do people that look like me do computer science? Um, uh, gender roles, activity stereotypes, child's goals and general self schemas. Do people like me succeed at this? Do I, am I a computer person? I can't tell you the number of people on the first day of class when I teach this course, uh, I teach it every spring, who calls me and says, I'm not really a computer person. <laughs> it's okay, it'll work, really, it will. Um, but I'm not actually impacting any of that really. What I'm impacting is here. You know, so thinking about it from an economic perspective, I'm changing the utility value. I'm saying computer science is about something that you care about. You care about digital media, and I can make it easier. I can reduce the cost. Right? So I don't know how to impact all of these cultural factors. These are really huge. But I can change this one, and that leads to fewer people dropping the course. Um, when the course first got started, I had uh, uh, Andrea Forte, who's now a, a associate professor at Drexel, ran the evaluation as the teacher. I couldn't be involved in the evaluation, so I didn't get to see any of the data until the class was over with. And this first quote was the very first one that I saw, and I continue to love it. Uh, I'm going to read it to you, excuse me. I just wish I had more time to play around with that and make neat effects, but Jess, the programming environment we built, will be on my computer forever. So that's the nice thing about this class is that you go as deep into the homework as you wanted. So I turned it in, and then me and my roommate would do more after to see what we could do with it. Um, this is a female liberal arts student admitting to coding outside the requirements of the class mm -hmm. and, and happy that she could. About a year after we started the course, we went back and tried to reach all the students who had taken the course to ask them about their experience since. And about 90% of the respondents had programmed since the class had ended without taking any other computer science classes. They actually saw this as being useful stuff. Did the class change how you interact with computers? Only 80% of the students said yes. And it made us realize their answers on the open-ended part made us realize how we had chosen a really bad question. Well, I interact with the computer using a keyboard and a trackpad. I, I think I interact with it the same way. All right, well, that was wrong. Um, but the, the kinds of things they're saying definitely makes me think of what is going on behind the scenes in such programs like Photoshop and Illustrator. Yes, that's a computational literate perspective. That's understanding what's going on inside of your tools. But I want to point out, for those of you, I'm, I'm a big fan of situated learning, uh, Lavin Wenger. I want to point out that one of the things that we had to do here was construct an imaginary world. When we started out, we said, okay, well, what is the community of practice of people who program in liberal arts, architecture, and business? It's mostly not there. So we had to construct an imaginary world for a future world that might exist. We actually used the, the phrase imagineering in one of the papers that we wrote, talking about the things that we did. So for example, all of our TAs are former students in the class, and they share with their students what they did when they were in the class. See, it's a community of practice. We all do this sorts of thing. Often when the students are, when the TAs are working on the, uh, the homework assignments, they'll share what they, the cool thing that they built on the programming assignment. It's all part of a community of practice. Story number two. Um, I had a student, Li Xiong Ning, who was very interested in how do computer science teachers develop a sense of identity? Uh, for people in the School of Education who are aware that identity of a school teacher, recognizing I'm a science teacher, I'm a math teacher, I'm a reading teacher, is really important for quality, for, for retaining those students, for, for those teachers, for having them seek out professional development opportunities. For the most part, a teacher's identity is, is related to their certificate. There is no teaching certification in computer science in most states. So how do they develop a sense of I'm a computer science teacher? That's what Li Jing studied for her dissertation. And what she found is that the main factors were confidence in their ability to teach. They needed more content knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge. They also needed a sense of community. They needed to be with a group of people where they could say, oh, Rhea Galanos, she is a computer science teacher. I want to be like her one day. And having that was a critical factor in getting them to develop a sense of uh, identity. But what I'm going to try to come to as we go through this is to point out that these are different goals than for software engineers. The bottom line, I'll say up front, is that putting future high school computer science teachers 
into the intro course where you're teaching them software engineering skills is the wrong thing. It's not teaching them what they need to be successful. So we asked a bunch of really good computer science teachers. What's our definition of really good? They like what they're doing. They're able to recruit students into their class, which for most people know computer science is an elective course in most areas. If you can't recruit students into your class, your cl you don't stay a computer science teacher. And third, your students have to actually succeed. So we actually look at people who pass, whose students pass the AP computer science test. Um, there are teachers who have been teaching for over a decade AP computer science and have not yet had a student pass. Um, we interviewed some of them too so that we could get a contrast. But let me re let you read that for a minute. Okay, so what do we see this teacher doing? Um, well, the teacher is reviewing student quizzes and is trying to identify misconceptions or gaps. She's having them explain to one another, engage in self-explanation strategies. She has them write code by hand away from the computer, which is reflective of the stories that Brian Danielak was telling me yesterday happens in Brian O'Shea's class. Um, she reads that and, and has them, oh, and has them write comments to one another and helps the students self-grade with a rubric. Okay, this is, this is an excellent computer science teacher. Let's look at what she's doing. She's writing assignments and comments. She's not coding. In general, our best computer science teachers almost never write code. They guide students through rubrics. They focus on a wide variety of learning activities, coding away from the computer, doing self-explanation activities. <coughs> In general, a successful computer science teacher is not a software developer. The activities they engage in is not what a professional software developer engages in. One of the quotes that Li Jing had about why it's difficult to be a computer science teacher. Because there are so few of them. If you're a math teacher, you have a community. If you decide to switch in computer science, you just cut yourself off from that community. And that's really hard. One of the ways that we tried to address this is we developed this program called the Disciplinary Commons in Computing Education. It was based on a disciplinary commons idea that was developed in the UK by Sally Fincher and then brought to the US um, by Josh Tenberg at the University of Washington Tacoma for uh, eight months during the academic year every sa one Saturday a month we brought all the teachers together and had them write course por portfolios describing their courses they did peer observation they visited each other's classes they talked about their classes we created that community of practice they got to see the role models they got to see the really good teachers we created communities we got them sharing resources and this was actually a critical one for high school teachers in Georgia Computer science is entirely elective. They needed to develop recruiting strategies. So we did the social network analysis when the teachers first got started. Only a few of them had any connection with one another. By the time we had ended, they'd all visited each other's classrooms or used resources from one another. They had a really rich set of social connections. That's how we create a community among the teachers. Um, this was a really remarkable one. Um, the recruitment strategies really worked for these teachers. They had a dramatic increase. And it's not just the strategies, as we'll see from this quote. They felt that the sense of community helped them in implementing these strategies. They felt they had people they could go talk to for help and how they were going to do it. And that gave them a sense that, the, that there was some, that they had backing for what they were doing. Now, the goal of the, uh, the National Science Foundation in 2010 was to have 10,000 high school computer science teachers within five years. That funding got started in 2011. It's now, been, it's now 2016. How far did we go? I've actually seen the report. It hasn't been publicly released yet, so, oh, we're record, recording, okay. Um, <laughs> 1,500. We missed by magnitude. Okay, we didn't get anywhere near. Now, part of the problem of trying to scale is we can't get enough teachers into a physical space. Could we give teachers the things that they need through online education? And that's what we started exploring. So we're trying to figure out how can we create online education that emphasizes the skills and knowledge of successful CS teachers and really does provide that sense of community. We're trying to do ebooks. Why ebooks? Because we recognize that in service teachers have very little bits of time in order to be able to do professional development, to be able to do anything online. We don't want to go with MOOCs. If a MOOC is a 10 minute lecture, I've just lost half of my 20 minutes. I want them engaged in activities. We've actually just recently studied of the 400 some teachers who have used our ebook over the last two years. Um, their average length of time that they spend using the ebook, an average session, 
is 15 minutes plus or minus nine minutes standard deviation. Yeah, 20 minute chunks. How can I teach computer science in 20 minute chunks? That's our challenge. So in our ebook, you can actually program inside the book and you can actually do media computation. We explicitly highlight misconceptions and we talk about how would you diagnose them. If a student is doing this with assignments, what kind of a misconception do they have about assignments? We have a, 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 a space where teachers can not just talk about the book, but also negotiate schedules. So we don't want this to be open-ended. Well, come along whenever you get a chance, because then there's no peer pressure to complete. We don't want to do a MOOC where we say, everybody's got to have these done on certain dates, or people fall behind. The idea is that we have reading groups, where a group of teachers will start on the book together and say, hey, how about if you finish chapter three by Saturday? Ah, oh, my kid got sick today after Monday. Okay, everybody, let's finish by Monday. So there is peer pressure, but it's peer pressure of a homogeneous nature. They understand the, the pressures on a teacher. A big part of what we explore in our, um, in our research is this problem. It's called a Parsons problem. I'm gonna give you a programming problem, and I'm gonna give you all the lines of code which solve the problem correctly, but they're on refrigerator magnets. Drag them into the right places, okay? This is a really interesting problem because, first of all, it is low cognitive load or lower cognitive load than writing the code from scratch. Nobody has any syntax errors ever. However, it is still a challenging problem. It takes students uh, a significant amount of effort. They actually do have to understand the code. This works great for the high school computer science teachers who are studying with us because they can look at a lot of Parsons problems in the amount of time that they could solve one programming problem. I mean, a programming problem in 20 minutes is a pretty small programming problem. I can have you do lots of Parsons problems in that time. You see more examples, more worked examples, more opportunities for practice. I'm going to give you only one finding from our ebook. Um, it's one of my, my, my favorites, though. So um, we have a wide variety of activities in our ebook. This is all of the activities in one chapter of our ebook. And it's colored by the kind of activity. So the purple is a video, watching a video. And this is the number of people who do that. Um, the uh, dark blue is running a piece of code. The light blue is editing a piece of code. Now, for the most part, computer science is pedagogically poor. Okay, any computer science class, what are the activities in the class? Go write this program. Go edit this code. Okay, and if that's the only activity you have, here's the number of students, and then here's the number of students, and then here's the number of students, and then that's it. That's all that's going to finish. Okay, where if we look at things like the Parsons problems, which are in purple, these stay pretty high. The orange is doing multiple choice questions. I'm sorry, the green is the Parsons problems. The purple is playing a video. Oh. Uh, playing an audio tour in red. In general, by having a variety of different kinds of things, a heterogeneous learning, act so that learning activities, we get a lot more people engaged than just if we had them just edit code. We keep people coming back because there's more things to be doing. Okay. So I think that the main two lessons that I take from the things that we've been doing is that computer science needs to be embedded and computer science needs to be tailored. What do I mean by embedded? We've learned that using computing in authentic context and classes really matters. Now, I don't think this necessarily means that all of the computing that we offer to students has to be in new classes. I think that the class that, that Brian O'Shea is doing, that Brian Daniel likes to study, is just absolutely fantastic. But we're not gonna get that many new classes to achieve computational literacy. I think we need to think about the way that I know that Gert in the Lyman Briggs is thinking about computing across the curriculum. But I don't think that we just want to say, hey, you want to have a lot of computing in your science classes. Instead, I think that it's really important to track where it appears. So we can say, in this class, you have this kind of a computing activity. In this class, you have this kind of computing activity. When we weave them all together, oh, this is really great, but it could be better if this activity was slightly tuned. And our assessment says that this activity wasn't very good. And you know what? There's a gap. You never got this. We need to make sure that happens somewhere in the curriculum. I don't think it's necessary. I think that math and science, particularly if not now, over the next five to 10 years, there's gonna be computational elements in most STEM classes. How do we track what's going on to make sure that our students are getting an effective education and achieving computational literacy? I think it's really important to think about developing professional development for pre-service computer science teachers. For the most part, this doesn't exist in the United States. I can count the number of programs on less than one hand. Um, and I think that that's important not just to develop the computational literacy of the teachers, but to think about how do we get to computational literacy for all of our students in elementary and high school. The second main theme for me is tailoring. Computing is not the same for everybody. What a high school teacher needs is not what a software developer needs. Um, and I think that we can similarly talk about the needs for a computational scientist and engineer is not exactly the same. 
One of my students, Brian Dorn, now an associate professor at the University of Nebraska, uh, Omaha, um, did a great dissertation studying graphic designers who teach themselves to program. Graphic designers can do some pretty sophisticated stuff to put things on the web or to automate things with Photoshop, and for the most part, they don't call themselves programmers. They call themselves artists. They're never going to take a class that says programming. They're never going to pick up a book that says how to be a programmer. We have to think about how do we tailor the computer science that fits them. I think we need to think about inventing future computational literacies and communities of practice like we did in the media computation class. All right, so maybe computing isn't in the mu com music composition class. I'm making that up. Um, maybe it is here. Um, but how do we fit it in there? And how do we make it authentic for them? And then we need new kinds of languages and tools. I was uh, talking with, with Danny and Brian this morning. There's a wide variety of powerful computational expression, um, kind of expressions, kinds of expression, that are currently not possible in the media which are easily accessible to students. At the school level, but obviously at the undergraduate level. We need new kinds of tools. Uh, for the most part, computer scientists build tools for themselves and for people that look like them. We need new kinds. So, I believe that computational literacy is critical to the needs of a 21st century democracy. It's about evidence, it's about understanding the data that's in your world, it's understanding the media and the computation that affects you. The challenges are really enormous. We're nowhere near universal computational literacy, especially in the United States. Two of the themes that I see in our work is that providing a context helps. Making it clear why they're learning the computing and why it's valuable to them. Second is that teachers don't need to be software developers. They need different kinds of computing. It's a different kind of computing education. And I believe in the future, computing education needs to be embedded in contexts that make sense and tailored to the individual needs. I have a lot of colleagues who have worked with me on this work, particularly Barbara Erickson, who is my partner on Georgia Computes and ESEP. Um, the Georgia Department of Education has been our partner in most of what we do. Thank you very much. Here's some URL for more information. Happy to take any questions you have. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. So, what questions do people have? Yeah, Bob. So, <clears throat> so I totally get the argument for embedding in different things. The challenge in a typical high school environment is that our curricula in the sciences, in particular, but math also some ways, is not all that coherent to begin with. Yep. How would you imagine creating a coherent computer computing curriculum or computing uh, uh, that in a diverse high school environment where you're embedding in multiple contexts? Yeah. So um, I am less worried about coherence as I am in adoption. Um, when I look at the numbers, I see very little computer science out there. Um, I'm in, in this area of providing some sort of adoption, I'm really inspired by Uri Walensky's work and the CT STEM work, where he's developed a series of star logo simulations that directly, they developed the crosswalk, directly mapped to NGSS goals. So that he can say to a teacher, a chemistry teacher, a biology teacher, okay, you're teaching X, well, it turns out that I've got a star logo unit that will fit into two, four, eight, whatever number of weeks you have that will allow your students to do computation that will directly address X. And since NGSS explicitly talks about modeling and simulation, it's a natural fit. He says it's actually really easy to provide the professional development to science teachers who are already interested in the topic to help them learn the computing needed to be able to teach that topic and teach that unit. Right? So I'm less concerned about trying to figure out a computer science curriculum for all of K through 12, and more interested in how I make computing work within the existing framework. And looking forward to a day when there's enough teachers who have learned either through embedding in their own classes or through pre-service programs. I mean, one of the arguments that I make is that um, we should be working on achieving universal computational literacy at the university level first. It's way easier to scale computing at a university than it is to scale in high schools. And if you reach everybody, like, like at Georgia Tech, if you re require everyone to take computing, the next generation of teachers all have had computing. Now, that isn't, I mean, thinking about professional development, thinking about how to create the coherent curriculum, that, that comes in. But having the teachers be computationally literate is a huge step in that direction. So I look forward to the day where we can really address the question of how we make sure that we're being coherent in K through 12 computing curriculum. Right now, I just want to have the people out there who are computationally literate. Yeah. Okay. So, you wanted to ask a question, but she had to leave. So, I'm going to ask it for her. Great. Um, so the role of what's that? The role of would be played by. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you mentioned early on was uh, that the impact 
later in, the, in someone's career of learning CS early on was really important to study. Are you doing any longitudinal studies around that? So early on, oh, oh, the only study that we've done of that nature is the one where we followed up with the Medicomp teachers, uh, the Medicomp students a year later. I guess Li Jing's was somewhat longitudinal in the sense that she followed teachers for two years um, to figure out which became successful computer science teachers, developed an identity as computer science teachers, and which did not. Um, unfortunately, she was doing this study around 2008, 2009, where a bunch of te one of her teachers, it's really tragic, um, in May was told she was being laid off, in August was told she was being rehired. Um, but, you know, her sense of belonging to the school system just crashed, right? She, she know, so she dropped out a year later, became a software consultant, made a lot more money. So, no, we haven't done a lot of that kind of work. Yes? Uh, you mentioned early on in your talk that a lot of these people that you train to be computational literate go off into industry and yep. software development and all that stuff. How much of that, do you have a sense how much of that is because they're not actually being compensated to teach people? Like in the same way? No, monetary? that isn't something that, that, that I've tried to explore. I think, I'm sure that's a real question. In ESEP, uh, the Expanding Computing Education Pathways, we deal with more of that. Um, certainly it's a big draw to go become a software developer. Um, but I think that there's also some really novel ways to draw people who are computationally literate into the classroom. Um, I'm a, a big fan of Texas's model where t uh, student uh, loans are forgiven if you're a computer science teacher for a number of years. Um, and in general, the, the, the time in classroom, the lifespan of a computer science teacher is much less than that of other kinds of teachers. I mean, what's the... What's the, the, the 50% of all STEM teachers leave within the first five years. I've heard estimates that STEM teachers, that the average lifespan is around seven years. Computer science teachers, code.org estimates three years. Okay, well, if I forgive your student loans, if you give me four years of teaching, it's a great deal for both of us. So uh, I think that's, I don't know that there's enough studies. I know that um, CSNYC, the effort to bring uh, computer science to all New York City schools, um, they doubt these. They don't think that, that it's, the, it's the money factor that's the major reason why they're losing <coughs> teachers. Uh, they think that it might be bigger factors. Um, if you don't have a certificate in computer science, you decide to teach for a few years, but you do have a certificate in math and science or reading or business or whatever, most often business, but in most of the 50 United States, computer science is classified as career and technical education. So it's most often people with a business certification who are teaching computer science. It's hard to be a computer science teacher. You're off on your own. So you can well imagine that somebody might do it for a few years and then give up. Nothing to do with the, the money, but deciding it's easier to go be another kind of teacher. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. Um, I have a question about one aspect that you didn't uh, mention uh, in K-12 teaching or uh, computational education. What, would you, what is your take on the role of the environment, of the community that the students live in? How can uh, they learn uh, do something that will involve the community also when they learn about? That's a, a wonderful question, which um, uh, at this point I have to give my normal disclaimer that uh, folks like Brian have heard me talk about this sort of stuff before. Um, to most questions that people ask me about what has been done in X in computing, computing education, the answer is nothing. Um, this is a very small community. The ICER conference has never been more than 120 people. Um, uh, you know, the number, um, I'm part of an NSF effort to try to grow computer science education within ed schools. And so we tried to identify, Amon's part of this as well, tried to identify all of the current education school faculty who work in computer science education. Um, we didn't need both hands. Um, so there's just not a lot of work out there yet. Okay, so to particularly address this issue, if you would have talked to me a month ago, I would have said, I don't know of anybody who's doing that work. But um, at the end of October, we had this fabulous summit, uh, joint with the Office of Science and Technology Policy. We brought in 16, or 16 states in Puerto Rico, and the Research and Practice Collaboratory, uh, Bill Penuel and um, Phil Bell and company, brought in some of their researchers. And I got to hear about the work that Nicole Pinkard is doing in Chicago. Wow, is she amazing. And she hasn't published any of this yet. So I was like, you gotta do this. Um, she's working hand in glove with Brenda Wilkerson, who's in charge of the Newark, the Chicago effort to put computer science in all the high schools. And Nicole's is coming up with these amazing ideas. For example, she decided, so how do you get to everybody outside of school? Parks and libraries. Those are the other two city facilities that reach everybody. 
So she works heavy with the libraries, parks. She was working with Comcast to put, create Wi-Fi vans that drive around. And for these number of hours, this park is a hot spot. I think it's fantastic. And because she's working with Chicago Public Schools, when a student comes to one of these after-school activities, she then gets the emails of all of the, of the parents and sends them emails that said, your kid just did X. Here's the next thing to do with them. So I, I think this is an amazing suite of activities that she's doing that's directly addressing this issue. How do we engage the entire community in helping these students become computationally literate? Yes? So I know, again, very little research is <laughs> the answer to the question. But uh, is anybody or what are the plans for tracking the results of where these students that are taking these courses from the very few computer science teachers in K-12 what their trajectory is. I mean, the goal here is pipeline issues, right? So how do, what happens to these students? I, I'm, I'm not sure I would characterize it as a pipeline issue because um, I think when you're talking about developing a computational literate society, you're talking about networks and graphs, right? Uh, not all these people are gonna go into STEM. I mean, Brian Dorn's dissertation is near and dear to my heart because he looked at graphic designers with art degrees who decided to learn programming. And how do you make programming palatable to them? How do you improve their efficiency and their effectiveness? Um, so, but I will say that uh, um, I know that this is a hot research topic. Uh, I, I do a blog in computing education. Uh, if you search Gustav blog, there's not that many of us. Um, and my blog today is about Joan Freeney-Mundy's comments at our summit. And she, she raised, she suggests, what she said she was doing was suggesting three research questions for the community. And what I heard is three warnings for the community. The first was, she said, you know, you should consider the value of computing as, as part of a high school graduation requirement. And she said, in particular, consider in the light of NSTA and NCTM. And I'm not sure how many people in the room realize that NSTA has recently come out with a statement against using computer science as a science class. NCTM has come out with a statement not quite as strong, but said, with caution, watch what you're doing. You know, in states that only require two science or two math, if one of those becomes computer science, yes, I get it. That's a problem. Okay? And so she explicitly asked us to consider, so what is the preparation of students when they reach college or career in terms of STEM if they're substituting computer science for one of those science and math? And I think she raises an excellent question. And since she just raised the question at the end of October, and I just blogged on it today, no, nobody has looked at this at all. <laughs> But I think it's a really important question that we ought to be looking at. What I would hope, I mean, based on work like, like Bruce Sharon's, that embedding computing actually leads to better STEM learning if it's well integrated, like the sorts of things I was talking to Bob about, the things that Uri Belinsky's doing. I could hope that computing becomes a lever for even deeper contextualization, deeper learning. But I don't know if that's happening, and that needs to happen. about the population, you know, overall Michigan and Georgia, we said they're sort of similar overall. Yeah. But the population at Michigan State and the population at Georgia Tech are certainly very different. Yeah, you're much more diverse than we are. So how does that, how does that play into like, you know, thinking about your, your research agenda um, and what that, how, how does that affect what you think your work might be like here? This is a great question. Uh, Mark and I were talking about this some last night. For the most part, my research doesn't have that much impact at Georgia Tech. I mean, I did media computation, and I've continued to track it over the years, but the places that are really innovating with media computation are not at Georgia Tech. So, for example, University of California, San Diego, has this remarkable result. They changed, they're on a quarter system. They changed the first quarter to use media computation, pair programming, which is having two students at a keyboard, so they do self-explanation strategies, um, and doing peer instruction in the class. They only changed one quarter length, 10 week course, and they have 60% more computer science majors in the sophomore year. I mean, that's, wow, what an amazing result. I mean, talk about, I mean, it's not long longitudinal, but a year later, you changed only 10 weeks and you have 60% more students. I, I think that's a really cool result. Uh, Celine Latuli at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, won the 60 uh, Best Paper Award two years ago. She created, uh, she has a media computation class where she did a flipped classroom model and she did pair programming as lightweight teams. Teams that you don't have to work together, but there's encouragement for you to work together. Led to significantly better learning. Um, and to me, again, it's a nice innovation on the media computation work. Um, so most of the work that I do, I look for who I can collaborate with. 
So if I were to come here to Michigan State, absolutely, I would love to work with, with Brian and the folks working on the CMSC classes and these new classes, um, the new uh, minor and undergraduate degrees they're creating. But at the same time, I expect that much of the research that I do will have impact el elsewhere. You know, uh, the, the policy work that I do, only some of it happens in Georgia. Um, I, spend, I spend way too much time in Columbia, South Carolina, arguing with people in the Department of Education there um, and getting yelled back at. Um, but, uh, the, and the, you know, so one of the really interesting questions, I, I know I've talked to some of the folks here, I don't know how to think about the pol public policy work I do as research. I don't know how to write it up. I don't know how to communicate it. I certainly can't do the scientific method. Well, I did this in this state. I did this other thing in this other state. But there's lots of interesting things that I learned. So, for example, one of the things we worked hardest on in terms of policy when we were in Georgia Computes was to get science and math teachers to be able to teach computer science. But career and technical education protected their, their teachers and said, no, we won't allow that. It's classified as career and tech. Only career and tech teachers can teach it, which limited the number of teachers who could teach computer science. It made professional development more difficult for us because we were dealing with teachers who didn't have a lot of science and math background. After Georgia Computes, the entrepreneurial community got interested said, you know, we need more coders. We're not going to be able to succeed at our startups without more coders. They talked to the governor. Literally within three months of them talking to the governor, all science and math teachers can teach computer science. We tried for six years. You bring a different party to the table, we have all kinds of new leverage that we didn't have previously. And so this has been one of my, one of my insights from ESA is it's different in different states. So for example, industry does not play a significant role in computing education in California, in public policy. For reasons I don't understand, they got the Silicon Valley thing there, and yet they don't really have, have play, play a significant role. But in Georgia and South Carolina, if industry is not at the table, the decisions don't get made. So absolutely fascinating. So uh, the, the, I guess the, the bottom line of that is I have no idea what the public policy lovers are in Michigan yet. That would be something that I would need to learn. I'll ask a question. Please. So, um, Yuri Wonski's solution sounds somewhat interesting, right? So, how like can I'm we get computation? What? <laughs> I feel like I'm at my PhD at now. <laughs> so, um, you can get computational thinking, computational science, literacy into the school system, but let's put it into science because it's going to help meet the standards. Yeah, right? that's, yep. that's the argument yeah, that we're That's making. his solution. Yep. On the other hand, Something still has to go. I mean, there's only well, so you had to time. achieve this goal anyway, right? But th to learn the computational aspects, that takes time too. Right. So that is right. A, so there is yeah. something that's going to have to get. You're going to lose something in that process unless the computational literacy is just not really computational li literacy. It's just procedural, which we don't want. Right. Okay. It's a great. So question. what do you give? Yeah. So. Um, Andy DeSessa's answer with Boxer is you start teaching Boxer in kindergarten, and now you've paid this cost at an early age, just like we would do with reading, right? We expect by, from first grade, in the, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, you're learning to read. From third grade on, you're reading to learn. Um, so you've paid the cost. Learning to, learning to read is a pretty complicated task, cognitively very expensive. Um, and yet we do it, and it's, it's, it becomes a, a lever for all kinds of other learning later. Andy's argument is that we can do it that way. I have a slightly different take. I'm wondering whether we can parcel out computation so that it isn't quite so complicated. We don't have to bite off all of it all at once. This is something that I was, I was talking to, to Brian and Danny about this morning. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, um, they talked about a little about yesterday, or two days ago. Um, I'm interested in teaching economic statistics and probability as a comp uh, through computation. Uh, economics is something that's taught particularly badly in schools. And I think that computing could make it much more concrete, much more interesting. You could model buyers and sellers and prices and products. The really interesting thing is that if you think about doing this as a discrete event simulation, there's no loops. There are no variables. And I can tell you from the studies of uh, pedagogical content knowledge and computer science, loops and variables are two of the biggest things that are hardest for students to learn. What if I could give you authentic, contextualized computing education experience that actually help you learn economic statistics and probability better without ever having you to learn loops and variables? I can get you started a lot faster. There's less friction. There's less of those things that you have to learn first. And I've started you on computation. 
And the next time you meet loops and variables, you have higher self-efficacy. You don't come up to it saying, I'm not a computer person. Now, I don't know if this will work, but I do think that we have bought too deeply into one model of what is computing. I mean, um, to be unfair, but I'll do it anyway over here, we bought into the Scratch model of computing. What's in Scratch, that's, that's elementary computing. And my suspicion is that there are other models of computing that might be easier that might be more powerful. They might not look like the things that we give to professional software developers. I mean, every professional software developer de deals with arrays and variables and functions and loops. I'm not convinced that every student needs that to get started. But I think if we think more, um, it, more innovatively about the kinds of computational expression we need and the kinds of tools that enable that expression, we can actually reduce the friction and make it span a number of years as opposed to paying it all up front. So a, a completely different sort of question. So coding boot camps are like a big thing. They sure are. Um, and they seem, on one hand, sort of teaching sort of procedural stuff that doesn't seem of much value. This is my, my uh, uninformed take on them. Yeah. Is there a way to have coding boot camps, summer experiences of a short period of time, say for high school students, that would be better than what's currently happening? And, and what would it look like? Wow. All right, it's a, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's a big one. So um, I happen to know about some unpublished work that Andy Coe has done at the University of Washington Tacoma where they did a series of interviews with people at, at boot camps. And they are amazingly unsuccessful. He interviewed people who were on their third boot camp. And since these boot camps are very expensive and they all guarantee as soon as finish the boot camp you can get, get a job. Right? The fact that somebody's on their third boot camp is an enormous investment for not much payout. So they don't work. How could we make them work? Um, I can tell you, I don't know if I can get back to it quickly. Uh, yes. Good. Much of this curve and this curve are due to Barbara Erickson's work, right? Did I get the right curves? I, I meant the, the Georgia black and Georgia female. So yeah. that's, yeah, the, uh, the, the gray one and the, uh, the, uh, the gold one, these two curves. Most of this growth, you know, these are clearly, as you can see, we ended in 2012 with Georgia Computes. And in some sense, we missed the rise of the black CS exam takers that happened afterward, okay? All of that, to the great extent, is due to Barbara Erickson. Barbara has done amazing things and been very inventive in how she thinks about recruitment, how she thinks about summer camp models, um, how she thinks about teacher PD. So, for example, one of the things that's going on here, particularly in the last three years, is um, Sisters Rise Up and Project Rise Up. She uses near-peer mentoring. She hires undergrads who are female or black to serve, to offer weekly webinars online, and then once a month face-to-face -face meetings to uh, African-American or female students taking APCS in order to improve their success rates. And every year that she's done it, the number and the pass rate of African-Americans Georgia has increased. So that's, that's a kind of activity that she can do. Now, the summer camps, Barbara has this really remarkable summer camp model that is um, re uh, replicable and reliable and sustainable. Um, she started summer camps at Georgia and explicitly figured out a model the business model that is actually sustainable. Um, you start out with a $5,000 investment to go buy tools like Lego Robotics, whatever it is. One of her in great in insights is you never offer only high school summer camps because high school kids can be left at home and you can't charge what it costs. You have to also offer elementary and middle school summer camps because those kids can't be left at home and so you can charge more than it costs, which then is what you can use to cover the costs of the high school. And our external evaluator has followed all of the camps that they created. We now have 12 other sites offering summer camps at University System of Georgia institutions. They all match um, the, the standards that we expected in terms of changes in attitudes and content knowledge gains. So yes, we can do good summer camps, and we can make them uh, replicable, reliable, and um, sustainable. OK, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.